Good morning and welcome, and it is good to be back and be visiting Fox Island uh, for, I think, the third time as, as guest preacher, fourth time overall. Our first scripture this morning comes from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away. You who have not attended them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to the fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall no longer fear or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Before sharing the gospel reading, I want to lead into it with a snippet of a story I was going to share more fully before the sermon evolved as sermons are wont to do that explains the sermon title. Um, the theme of compassion is still there, but the texts move me in a different direction. But six summers ago in June, I got a call from an alum who was part of the Vietnamese Buddhist temple of Tacoma and Pierce County, sharing that the temple had been vandalized by someone who had attacked the front of the temple using racist and Christian-centered slurs, calling the abbot a devil worshiper. It was learned that this person did this inspired by what he heard in a sermon that Sunday at his church. My friend, former student, mobilized a group of interfaith clergy and leaders to respond and offer support and show care and compassion. Lots of things happened, but at the end of that process, a group of us were invited to the temple to spend time with the abbot and the community. And in the course of that, those of us who had sought to care found ourselves cared for, fed amazing food, shared tea, shown art, and given gifts. And the gift is what brought me to the sermon title and brings me into this hook about compassion throughout what I'm going to share today. That the Abbott, who was an artist and a metal worker and a poet and lots of amazing skills that I have none of, he wrote a uh, Buddhist calligraphy for each of us. And the one that he gave to me simply said, compassion always. When I saw Jesus' words that I'm about to read, talking about compassion, it hooked me directly back into that moment and into what that experience of trying to give compassion and instead receiving compassion meant for me. And it's part of a much broader arc of my story that I'll share in a moment. But I wanted to explain the sermon title since I'm not going to go there in the actual sermon. So the gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 through 34. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Will you pray with me? Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. As I shared in, in seeing this text a few weeks ago, it 
to begin thinking about what to share this morning. I was hooked back to that experience that I, I briefly described. But I was also in that experience six years ago, hooked back to my graduate school experience in which some of what I engaged really has shaped my role and my relationship and my ministry around themes of care and compassion and hospitality. That has become for me a center point for my, my journey and my life. And while I found myself disagreeing with a lot of what I was taught in seminary, which should surprise nobody, perhaps the most important mark that was left on me by, by those faculty and those scholars and those theologians was, that, was the belief that the practice of living out, embodying, practicing Christian virtues was far more critical to participating in the way of Jesus than the ideas behind those virtues. That for all of the great words and books that these brilliant scholars could write, and they wrote plenty, something about the embodied presence of seeking to live out the practice, the enfleshment, the community real world love was at the core of a meaningful Christian life much more so than a set of ideas that float around in the sky um, that people with lots of degrees can understand, but they can't really share into community as well. At that time, I was particularly drawn to two virtues mentioned repeatedly in Christian texts and found in parallel in the Hebrew Bible. Threads of both compassion and hospitality run throughout the life of Jesus, the story of God's steadfast love in Hebrew scriptures, and the writings of Paul, Yet in comparison to other virtues and theological themes, they're relatively ignored, minimized in Christianity. That often translates when scholars do that and talk more about nice fluffy ideas like grace and sin and atonement and resurrection. That kind of focus translates into our communities, into our world. And yes, we make space for acts of compassion. We talk about hospitality but they're not given the richness, the fullness that other theological themes are often given. We'll set hospitality aside for this week since that's in the next text and I'll touch on that briefly, but, but compassion runs through both of these scriptures. In the reading from Jeremiah, God sees the people suffering, torn apart and scattered into exile. God sees the abuses of power and poor choices by the leaders of the people. And in Jeremiah's words, God offers a promise of safety, of justice, care, and compassion. That even though the world has failed you, I, God, will gather you in and care for you. And then will establish a system, a place, a kingdom in that language, a community perhaps in ours, in which you will be loved and cared for. The short text from Mark shows Jesus seeing the needs of the crowds that followed him and quite simply says he is driven by compassion and he has compassion for them and begins to teach them. There's something bigger going on in Mark though that I want to invite us to spend some time with, to look at how to bridge this idea of compassion as a divine virtue, that kind of fluffy thing up there that I was poking at a few minutes ago, into something that is in our flesh, in our bones, in our hearts, in our churches. I'm not sure if those who have recently preached here have chosen the mark options from the lectionary the last several weeks, but today's reading is the end of that arc from Mark. That was an awkward rhyme. Um, <laughs> arc from Mark, Mark from Ork, I don't know. Um, I had to, sorry. But I wanna pull back from these five, six little verses and look at the story, because I think that as a whole, it does something really profound that in the, the chunks of lectionary readings and the lectioner's choice to end the Barkin texts here, we might lose. First, we saw Jesus in Mark's telling of the story bring the movement to his hometown where he was rejected and scorned and marked, mocked in Mark. So Jesus, hurt by rejection and insults, refuses to heal or even teach in that town. The next week, he sends the disciples out in pairs, taking his ministry out into the world beyond what he could do himself. But 
In my reading, perhaps building on the, the hurt and the wounds that he experienced emotionally in Nazareth, he strictly instructs them to, rather rudely, walk away from anyone who rejects them in their ministries. Last week, Mark takes a brief turn and shares the story of the murder of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. Mark does not say it explicitly, but in my imagination at least, the murder of his cousin finds its way, the news of the murder of his cousin finds its way to Jesus rather quickly, building on a rough, painful set of experience. Jesus has had a bad few weeks. Today's reading and the rest of the chapter, which the lectionary does not include, Bring this story full circle. Bring the weeks of hurt and loss back to Jesus and his immediate community, concluding this, this storyline. I imagine Jesus hurt, exhausted, perhaps angry. The disciples returning from their mission to go out and teach and heal, coming back. But the energy of the movement has grown so that it's, it's so busy they can't even find time to eat. Jesus seeing this and perhaps recognizing his own needs, his own brokenness in the moment, tries to take them away to a quiet place, a retreat, some place where they can recover and catch their breath. But when we get there, that quiet place, place is, surprise, full of people waiting for them to do something. Where some of us, me at least, would have turned the boat around, not that I know how to turn a boat around, and gone someplace else. Jesus is moved somehow. Mark doesn't say what his thought process is, but he sees the people, he sees them hungering for something, he sees them out in the wilderness at the end of the day. And he has compassion on them, comes ashore and teaches them. And I wish the, the, the lectionary continued to what's next because as soon as he teaches them, they're hungry for food. And this is where we see Mark's version of the telling of the feeding of the 5,000. The teaching is only the beginning of the compassion. It goes to body, mind, and spirit. Mark moves immediately into the hunger of those who have come to see him teach, to experience his care. And Jesus directs his followers, his close friends, to take the bread and fish they have and share it out. And whether you read this as a mystical miracle or a metaphor for what we can accomplish in community, the people are fed. Interestingly, Next week's lectionary gospel is from John, and we shift to John for several weeks, and it's John's telling of the feeding of the 5,000. And it's the same story and so different. John writes with his typical mystical and theological language, but Mark tells the story simply. John is trying to, to make a big meaning out of this moment. Mark shows Jesus showing and embodying compassion. It's a purely human story. He goes through in these few chapters, the story that I just summarized, the, the hurt, the loss, the bitterness, the overwhelm. And then Jesus sees people in need and has compassion on them, makes sure they are fed. And in these moments, as this arc of Jesus hurt and return to this, this teaching and, and feeding ministry, Jesus' hurt and frustration are bathed and healed in his compassion and hospitality for the people. This is a healing moment for Jesus. He is shown compassion by the fact that the people still are hungering for him and doing what he does best, which is care and love and feed and teach. We see the end of this cycle of, of loss and bitterness in the Markan narrative. Part of what I appreciate about Mark as a whole, even though I find him frustrating in other ways, is that his portrayal of Jesus is relatively raw. It's not filtered by as many decades of history and theological infighting as Matthew, Luke, or John. It's not that I think that Mark is necessarily more accurate or as complete as the other gospels, but he has less baggage. Less social, political, cultural weight has attached to the Jesus movement when he's writing just 20 or so years after Jesus' death. Mark still sees Jesus as divine, but many of the portrayals, including today's texts and the surrounding narrative, offer a more human, more accessible image of him. Through this difficult, hard time, it is Jesus seeing the needs of the crowds and having compassion on them that reorients his ministry following the debacle at Nazareth and the murder of his cousin. 
For me, this is a more relatable Jesus. Our lives, our world, our families, our work can be fraught and exhausting. We light the peace candle knowing that it is part of a narrative of changing a world, of making peace, of resisting that, that hurt, that harm, that hardness. We know this in our families, in our bodies, with health and fights and disagreements and all the, the things that, that make it hard. We know this in our communities, political, social, religious, cultural, where disagreements quickly become ruptures, become tears, become brokenness. We live in a moment as the, the letter from the, uh, the pastor, the, the head of the UCC that was shared earlier says, in which political violence has reemerged on the national stage, building out of years, decades of violent rhetoric. With that, we go into this fall, knowing we face a very polarized, very difficult time politically as a country. With all of these things swirling around us, the macro and worldwide wars and politics, the personal and embodied, there are times we need a break, need to retreat, need to do what Jesus tries to do for himself and his friends. And when we are able, in the midst of crisis and chaos or at the best of times, where we can lean into and try to embody the sort of compassion Jesus is moved by when he sees the hungry crowds. When we can extend compassion to those in need, when we can, can extend compassion to ourselves and to those closest to us. We are invited into this, these sacred moments of embodying this vital virtue that relates to love and grace and a lot of the big ideas, but being able to be compassionate for each other and for God's world is a grounding, centering space. Jesus shows us an example of here in his own brokenness and that we are invited into in our own lives and work. I end with three questions, not to answer today, but to, to stew with, because they're the ones I've been stewing with in writing this. What is one way that you can show compassion to yourself or to others this week? That's the easy one. What are the, what's a thing, a simple one thing you can do? Thinking of this community. And as an occasional guest, having my own answers and thoughts about this and seeing it happen, but what is the role that compassion plays in the life of this congregation? Perhaps, for me, the hardest to wrestle with and to sit with. Where have you been shown compassion in your life? Where have you received the kind of gift of being cared for? When you needed it, whether you knew that or not. Compassion is one of those gifts that is given to us and that we can share with others. As we seek to live out and live into the remarkable and messy and confusing at times way of Jesus, may we find times and ways to seek this particular virtue and many others and to live it out in ways that embody the best of what God calls us toward. May we always have compassion for each other, for ourselves, and for God's creation. Amen. <laughs>